Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery programming series for our current show, Quilt National 2021, The Best of Contemporary Quilts. This exhibition is produced and circulated by the Dairy Barn Art Center in Athens, Ohio. Today, we're thrilled to present artist John Leffelholtz, but first, there are just a few housekeeping items to go over. Everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode, so feel free to utilize the chat function in your control panel to ask questions. We'll monitor those questions and be sure to get them in the Q&A portion of the hour. Next, live captioning is available for this artist talk and you can access those by clicking on the closed caption icon and selecting show subtitle. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth for internet stability. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right, to get everyone comfortable, go ahead and click on that chat function in your control panel to say hello and let us know where you're tuning in from. And that is it, now to you, John. Okay, uh, I'll click. My name is John Luffelholtz. Um, I live in Athens, Ohio. I've lived in Athens since 1985. Before that, I lived in Macedonia, Ohio. I grew up there. Um, Macedonia is a suburb um, halfway between Akron and Cleveland. This is a picture of me in my studio uh, in 2002. And here is a picture, a self-portrait of me in my studio present day. Things are a little bit more saturated, a little busier. So I'll start off with some of my student work. Um, I went to Ohio University. I couldn't quite decide what I wanted to do. I started in engineering and then started searching for other things and took some, some elective classes and art classes were one of those things. Um, this is a hand-built ceramic piece. Here is a, an image of it from the top. And this is about 10 inches tall, 12 inches wide. Sort of has this hidden feature to it. Here is a self-portrait I made in that same class. This is a piece that I learned that um, in art, you can make mistakes and you can make those work to your advantage. Or you, if you pay attention to the mistakes, you can have a new perspective on what you're doing. So this piece broke off um, at the base as I was making it. But in the process, it sort of turned into a, a piece where it was laying on its side. So it sort of has that sleeping or resting pose to it, which is sort of interesting. After college, I didn't make a whole lot of art immediately. Um, I started doing some digital images. Uh, this is about the time that home computers would have the ability to do vector drawings. And so I started experimenting with that. Um, these are tessellated forms that look um, a lot, well, sort of play after MC Escher. Um, these are loons. Here I'm starting to experiment some with the colors on the computer. And so the digital prints were nice, but I felt that I wanted to do something that was more handmade. So I figured out a way to adapt those to uh, wood and I started cutting out plywood. And it's sort of like a puzzle piece that's put together and I stain the wood different colors. These were smaller pieces. This is a detail of a piece that's only like 12 by eight, something small to hang on the wall. Here are dinosaurs again, being computer generated, transferring it to something um, more tangible. Elvis and guitars, starting to make things larger about this time, around the mid 1990s. I've got it so that um, I'm morphing one shape to another. This is cars to fish. Somewhere in there, there's that sort of ambiguous shape that's sort of a car or a fish, or could be both, which is I, I found kind of interesting. So I'm starting to make work that's a little bit more narrative. Also starting to make work at this time that's larger. I'm still working with wood in the computer. This is a four by eight sheet of plywood where I've taken pegs and stuck it into the plywood and the cut out tessellated pieces or the shapes are now able to go up and down so I can get sort of this negative space and these shadows going on. 
in the form. I, um, in addition to being an artist, I'm also um, part owner of a bicycle shop and was starting to look at things that I could utilize um, and sort of found object ways and how to repurpose things. So these are, uh, this is a bicycle hub and spokes that I turned into a candle holder. And in looking at that, I decided, okay, what if I made it so that it was a uh, larger scale, if I combine those together and had them overlap and it's sort of like this beaded structure. This is a detail of a much, much bigger piece. This is um, 95 tall. And again, I'm using the hubs and painting them now and painting the spokes. So I'm getting this color again, as, this, as, as I had worked with the computer images, I sort of started out in a rather black and white and started sort of introducing color. Um, this piece now hangs in my house and um, we have parrots that are free to roam about our house and they love frolicking on this piece. So up to now, I'm starting to make things bigger. I'm starting to make them a little bit more involved. Um, my wife had said, you know, you have to go see this show at the dairy barn. It's called Quilt National. And at first, actually probably for about four years, I, I was in the situation where it's like, yeah, quilts, it's, yeah, whatever. When I get some time, I'll go over there, but it's not really my, my thing. Um, but I went in and I looked at them and I realized that these were people that were taking things, taking a traditional medium and, and doing it in a way that was new. And I, I read the entry form for it um, and realized, you know, realized that they were actually encouraging people to make um, fresh approaches to the medium. And that there was a structure for the quilts that needed to, you know, you needed to follow as far as being two distinct layers that were stitched together. So I asked myself, how would I make one of these? And I was in my kitchen. I thought about it for a long time. I was in my kitchen. I was looking outside at flies trying to get through the window screening. And it kind of hit me all of a sudden, all these different ideas that had been going through my head was like, well, what if the window screening was fabric? And I could probably come up with a piece like that. And what if I included flies in the piece? So the idea was, what are the flies trying to get at? And it, it was um, came to the idea that it would be a grid of sugar packets um, that, that I could illustrate something more meaningful than just the sugar the flies getting to. So I did it of an overall image of a $100 bill. And this piece is 73 by 33. Um, just a little over six foot, almost three feet tall. And then because it was a layered construction and I had sort of this, all these pieces I was putting together, I realized I could put in a lot of different meaning into those layers. So sugar being a commodity, money is, you know, what you buy your commodities with. Um, the, the the stitching on this is actually mint flavored dental floss. So that sort of ties in with the name of it um, being money for nothing. The back of it um, had a bunch of glue on it from gluing down those sugar packets. So I came up with an idea to mosaic out um, a, a big green eye of envy. So that sort of tied in with the whole thing. So this this piece got a lot of attention. And I was happy with how it turned out. And it was, it was like this light switch had turned on. It's like all of a sudden I have this, this greater vocabulary and a greater, greater like arrows in my quiver would I, you know, that I could put together and make things. And so this was really encouraging and it, it led to um, sort of launching point for me getting into making quilts. So the next piece uh, went back to the digital um, to the computer and was doing some sketches and had this vision of a car coming at you and did some morphing with that. Uh, went to the computer, made it so that I um, was going to decide how it was going to get laid out and mock that up. Um, and I chose equal packets for the next piece. And so I wanted to have this big overall impact of it from afar. Um, had to decide who was going to be driving inside the car. That's Elvis and Barbie. Um, so it's sort of this sweet and low, this big vehicle coming at you. Uh, this piece is, uh, I did this in 1999. It's 65 by 45. 
And so it's really overly embellished, very, very gaudy. Next piece was uh, equal packets and uh, chose a quote done by Georgia O'Keeffe. And she uh, said that she couldn't paint a copy of what she was looking at. She could paint an equivalent. So that was the idea of using equal packets. And then these are everything up to now has been illustrated on with graphic marker. And I did a callback to the flies and on the, the Georgia O'Keeffe homage, I did a, a bumblebee. This is a small piece I've included in the, the slideshow. Um, and I'm starting to think about the hand illustration is, is fun, but they're coming together a little slower than I want. So it was like, well, what if I start printing my own things? And so I started experimenting with printing money for, for my artwork, not for other purposes. Um, and so this is just a small setup, uh, quick on fabric. So sewed the fabric onto, sewed printed tracing paper onto the fabric. Um, that led to um, thinking about it in broader terms and thinking about money and using the pun on the word Monet. Um, so I decided to make a Monet homage. And of course I chose his water lilies. And in that I chose um, dragonflies. And the dragonflies all have quotes about the nature of art and money is sort of asking you, you know, what makes this so valuable since art technically has no intrinsic value. So this is 48 by 47. Made another piece uh, similar to that one and chose postcards for this one. And then also chose uh, those postcards to have quotes and the wings this time, I didn't put words on them. I decided to put some just uh, symbology iconic iconography. Here's a close up of that. I do go back to making things that are more sculptural. I think the, the quilts always come out uh, having a lot more ways to interpret um, than the sculptures. I try you know, to get more into the sculptures, but sometimes I just want to make something. So this is my um, beaded bike. Um, from afar, it looks like, hey, it's a really cool paint job, but when you get up close, it's actually covered with 100,000 glass beads. And um, I did a callback to the digital prints. This is a, a I did it in a pattern that's tessellated, so it's a, it's a gecko sort of shape that is repeated and seamless throughout the tubes. Went back to doing some work with uh, the spokes and hubs. In this case, I decided I was going to wrap the spokes with thread. Uh, instead of painting them. So it has sort of this neat texture going on with those. And I like the way that the hubs sort of look like they're blooming. Here's an overall of that. Um, back to the quilts, I'm thinking about money again. And I mean, that's the thing about art, you know, somebody once told me early, said, you know, art is making one thing and then building on that and then building on that and then building on that and building on that. And so I do like to go back and I don't, I don't consciously like to go back and say, I'm going to build on this or build on that. It's sort of a, just a general feeling I have like, oh, that, that kind of was, I'd like to expand or think about that a little bit more. And it kind of rolls around in my head and somehow comes out. So this was a, a piece that has pennies all over it. Um, and I wanted it to be about health. And um, I titled this one, Pennies from Heaven, Make Your Ticks Count and how, you know, time is only so is finite for us. Um, and so they're, they're stylized uh, transfusion blood bags. So it's about health and time. And then it's, you know, it's covered with uh, blood sucking ticks of my own design. Um, Hillary Fletcher, previous director of Quilt National in 2000, I think, or 2001, approached me with um, some canceled stamps she had from all the international entries. And so we made a small piece for that, um, for the, I guess it would have been for 2001 Quilt National and they auctioned off that piece or raffled it off, excuse me. Um, so that was just a, a global tie into it. And this one has little satellites on it that are beaded um, and also have little quotes on the, the solar panels for the satellites. Here's a self portrait, uh, me being two-faced talking about duality of man. And then I'm making my own little packages now. These are insistent wild oats. Here's a sculpture um, called Bean Buzz. 
where I'm trying to capture that coffee makes you kind of jittery. And I'm going back and calling in some of those, uh, that bumblebee sh that I had made for the Georgia O'Keefe. And I've got actual coffee beans in this one. I like showing this one because, you know, you get a fresh bag of coffee and then you could spread it around on the bottom and it's, you know, you get that olfactory level going on. Here's a piece I made for um, shortly after 9-11. It's uh, nine of the, the red sort of stylized thread wrapped uh, hub and spokes. And then there's 11 of the blue ones sort of coming up out of the rubble. Here's a detail of that where they're overlapping, kind of get this purplish going on. Here's a small piece I made um, as a commission that uh, is called, titled Ring of Fire. And uh, it's about gasoline and how it's burns, 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 I guess. Here's a sketch um, that I'm starting that um, I'm thinking about quilts and making a traditional one. And this is something where I had looked at a lot of other quilt artists work um, and how they would do a callback to a, a traditional pattern and then make it into more of their own. Um, so I'm sketching out what a double wedding ring would look like. I'm thinking about one point I was thinking about making it look like a corset and um, it didn't quite work. It was gonna be difficult to, to do and it wasn't immediately recognizable. So I went back to the more traditional format. Here's a couple sketches where I'm just trying to figure out what color I want it to be. Here's a sketch about you know what, what details I want on the actual surface of it. So again, I'm thinking about double wedding, um, consumption, constriction. Um, here are sketches of, excuse me, of the uh, the paper that I was going to use to construct it before I printed it out, and then the paper what I bonded to the paper with uh, tool net using uh, acrylic medium. Here's an overall sketch of what I'm hoping the piece will look like, and then here's the actual piece. And this piece is 62 by 73. Um, it features kitchen matches on it, and they're not real kitchen matches. They're actually um, kitchen matches where I've cut off all the heads and then dipped them in uh, acrylic paint, which we had to explain to a few people that were displaying it. There's no, it's not real kitchen matches. So then when you get in closer, you can see there's where um, some of the details from the sketches were showing up. And then I, of course, have tying the knot in the, the ropes on the outer edges. Um, and I've got some traditional fabric in there as well, and using it in a more traditional way. And then uh, I've got these little fire ants running all over it that I beaded on there. So again, I'm getting this kind of like with quilts, I can really layer up a whole bunch of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be a hard edge uh, interpretation of what you know I want it to be. It's just something that you can come in at any level and decide how you want to interpret it yourself. Um, here's some sketches for uh, airplanes. That I'm thinking about doing, and I'm thinking about um, pushing the envelope and breaking the barriers. You know, those are two uh, sort of sayings that come with airplanes. So I'm thinking about using aluminum as the fabric-like material, and how I can do that. So I'm thinking about weaving aluminum together and different ways to do that. Um, this is titled "Breaking the Barrier." It's 38 by 62. This piece uh, is triple woven aluminum, and then it has weed trimmer line in it. And then it's lit from behind. And the blue is actually, they are um, marbles, glass marbles. So when you look at it and you turn it off, it has a whole different uh, feel to it. And this, it's like a giant light bright in some ways. Here's another piece that came after that. It's actually asking, is this a quilt? Um, this one's titled Pushing Pushing the Envelope. And of course, it's in a shape of an envelope detail of that one. And then I had a chance to exhibit and I had only two of these and I wanted to have three of them. So I made a third one to go with it. It's a little bit different than the other two. You using the same materials. Um, on this piece, I'm taking uh, nylon net and taking the clear acrylic media and sort of bonding it to the aluminum. And then 
it's sort of talking about the nature of how things change over time. Uh, the Johnson Hummer House in Coshocton approached me uh, to make a piece for their their quilt, their semi annual biannual quilt show. Every two years they have it called Pushing the Surface. And for 2003, they wanted something that was associated with the bicentennial of Ohio. So this piece is called Ohio Star, Star Bar. Um, it's about 58 by 65. It uh, features cardinals because those are our state bird. And on the cardinals wings, they have little quotes. And then I've made nutrition bars or power bars or energy bars of my own design to be the overall image. Here's a small piece that I was just sort of playing around with, put it together quickly so I could make a larger piece that sort of uh, did an homage to Vincent van Gogh. And this piece is, um, I'm making little sandbags of my own design. And the idea being that Carl Sagan had said that quote about if you took all the grains of sand on all the beaches in the world, it would not be enough to amount to all the stars in, the in all the galaxies. And so the idea of sort of that we're alone, lonely in this uh, universe by ourselves. This is actually, I made this before we started discovering planets. So that's, that's a little different meaning now, which is something I enjoy about going back and looking at these pieces. You know, they mean one thing to me when I'm making them and they can mean something completely different as I'm, um, as time goes on. I do enjoy that when you look at something close up, it looks like one thing and from a distance, it looks like another, I think. A lot of quilt art looks that way where you, you know, you get an overall pattern from afar, but when you get up close, you can start to see the piecing and you get really close, you can start to see the, the fine stitching. So here I'm taking chain links and sticking them onto or sewing them onto fabric with beads. And from afar, it looks like uh, it's a bicycle race. This piece is 35 by 59. Here's a I guess uh, a piece I made that um, is a, going back to Van Gogh. This was a commission and um, I chose his sunflowers for this piece. And I'm playing on the word of Van Gogh. I like including puns. Um, I think humor is a good way to, to open up your mind, um, kind of get your guard down, start thinking about the humor instead of thinking about everything else that you're dealing with. Um, there are packages and we're playing on Van Gogh being Van Gogh. And then there's little moving vans actually on the packages. And then again, I'm using that Goldfinch has quotes about Van Gogh on it. Um, again, the Johnson Hummer House in Coshocton had approached me and said, we wanna do a show that where artists look at a piece in our permanent collection and make a piece related to that. And so they had a Koshari doll. And I was like, that's, really kind of cool that the it was striking as far as the contrast of the piece and I wanted to learn more about it so I learned about uh, Kusharis and Native American uh, clown culture and I mean, it's not not so much I mean it's even more than just Native American we all have clown cultures if you go to the circus or when we used to be able to go to the circus or um, even sitcoms there's always a clown on there somebody sort of points out how frivolous and silly we are um, so there's a whole culture of that in Native America, where these people dress up like this and they have dolls and they go to dances and festivals. Um, they use watermelons to show how gluttonous we can be at times. And so I was thinking, I was on this homage kick and I was thinking, okay, who in the art world is similar to a Koshari? And there's tons and tons and tons of people to choose from that, but I, I chose Andy Warhol. And so I made uh, soup cans of my own design that were watermelon soup cans doing a callback to the Koshari with a watermelon. Um, and then uh, made 98 soup cans. Uh, this is called Pure Harmony. It's an homage to Jackson Pollock. And we're using abstract, American abstract expressionism traveler checks. So I'm sort of meshing that all together. There's a great quote, laughter is instant vacation, talking about humor, how it's a, it's a good way to sort of open up your mind and free things look, come at it from a different perspective. There's some quotes on here by Jackson Pollock and some quotes on by Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, here's a more personal piece where it's uh, taking that traditional pattern of robbing Peter to Paul, pay Paul, which is a traditional quilt pattern, and I'm deconstructing it 
and sort of trying to be um, a dialogue about when I'm one place, I want to be another place. When I'm in the studio, I think I should be somewhere else. When I'm somewhere else, I think I should be in the studio. And so I have sort of these nuts, uh, hard edged nuts mixed with honeycomb cereal that um, I've sewn to the, the surface. And then there are thin gray lines on this piece and frayed edges. Again, just sort of some stuff to set you into a mood to think about it. Um, around 2006, I was approached by a group that wanted to put up quilt barns in Athens County, Ohio. And Quilt Barn started in Adams County, Ohio with Donna Sue Groves. And it's grown to be, I think, internationally, you know, they're all over the place. And so they had said, well, we want you to, since you're a quilt artist, we want you to choose some traditional patterns and colors for it. I was like, ah, that's, that just sounds too constricting. I, I don't do that kind of stuff. But then, um, I start a lot of projects that way where I'll think about it and it's like, well, how could I, how would I approach that? How can I make that a little bit? How can I put a spin on that and make that ball curve a little bit more? So I chose to use local, local historical imagery. And so Southeastern Ohio is part of Appalachia, which has a uh, rich coal history, coal mining history. So I made a block of my own design, which was uh, miners helmets that shine into a black diamond. And these are, um, eight by eight and they're basic, they're pretty much painted murals that go up on, on people's barns. And so this is uh, my design, all roads lead to Athens in a sort of traditional style, but still um, something that ties into Athens County. It's a stylized A, it's a stylized road going off into the distance. We're big on pawpaws here down in Athens County. Um, so I made a pawpaw block that featured the, the bloom of the pawpaw, which is one of the things people always forget that they have this really cool purple flower comes out of about this time of year, actually. And then uh, did a riff on the coppola that's on the dairy barn. So there's a dairy barn star block that's there. And so with that project, I was also having the graphics experience from 10 years earlier and sort of working that. The the tourism bureau approached me to make a map and set up uh, loops on it. So again, we're calling back to making it a, a bigger project um, and getting that map all set up to go. And so the quilt barns led me to thinking about taking something from the past and mixing it into something from the future. And I, about that time, I started doing these, these morph pictures where you, you take something that's um, oops, skipped one from the past, and you can mix it to something current. You know, so at first it was just pictures of things from the past to the new, and then it was like, well, there's an old car advertisement. What if you went to the junkyard and found that car and took a picture of it, and then superimposed it so it morphed from one to the other? And then it went a step further, where it was like, well, okay, what if it's an old streetscape of the town you live in, and it morphs from one to the other? So this is this is actually a picture of Athens um, Court Street, our main main strip from. 1890s and then of course it morphs into that current one so it gets you thinking about how art again builds from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing and it can be not just what you make and build upon it can be what you know culture has presented to you before and that you can uh, go a step further on that which i is 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 i don't know just one of the greatest things about art i can think of um the dairy barn approached me to make a cow. There, I mean, it's a popular thing to have um, cows or horses or ceramics or big ceramic things and have artists decorate them and have them displayed all over town. And Chicago was famous for cows. And the dairy barn um, was able to acquire a cow because they just wanted one for their collection because they're a dairy barn. So I have this blank canvas. At one point I was gonna cut it up and then they said, no, nah, we're not real happy with that. And I was like, yeah, that's probably gonna be really hard to do. So we didn't cut it up and then put it back together. But I decided to go back to mooing and Monet and money and sort of tying that all together. So I'm using pennies in the Holstein pattern, covering it and then um, painting in the style of Monet on it. On one side, it's the water lilies. And then on the other side, it's the, uh, his sunset on the San Giorgio Maggiore, the, the island in Venice. Instead of the buildings on the island in Venice, I put the dairy barn there. So she lives at the dairy barn if you want to go visit her. 
Um, I do go back to looking at found objects and making sculptures. These are bicycle rims that I've sort of shaped into the, um, a Nautilus. And I've got tuna fish to go with him. And I have a whole school of those. I'd go back, um, call back on some other works where I um, sometimes need things that are a little bit more meditative instead of all the, the constant thinking and churning. Um, so I went back and made another piece of the, uh, the chain links and painted them. And then that's a, uh, another bike race. This is 33 by 60. This piece was uh, acquired and donated to the James Cancer Museum um, for a young man, Corey Lunger, who passed away um, to leukemia. Now it hangs permanently in the leukemia ward. Uh, the city of Athens approached me to put a one of those quilt blocks, those eight foot by eight foot murals on their arts building. So um, it started out as a, as a community project where uh, we took it to a festival and let kids put their paintings on it. So it has all these little graffiti and things that, and then I went ahead and backfilled it in with uh, a more uniform pattern. So up close, you can sort of see the graffiti and then from afar, it looks like one thing. Here it is on the building. We call it Arts West. It's on our west side of town. Did a series uh, where I was asking what would it be like if Mona Lisa had social media? So I chose to go to, uh, make the work 64 by 64, sort of a tie into the computer language. Um, it has social butterflies all over it. And on those butterflies are quotes about, they're, they're fictional quotes of, you know, what would Mona Lisa be talking about if she were talking on social media? And a lot of them are really, really silly um, and do reference our current times. I think one that comes to mind is, you know, she's upset that the Swiss guard has come in to guard the Vatican and why can't they use local people and why are they why are the Swiss stealing our jobs? And there's there's things about there about you know hiding your money in the Cayman Islands um, since they were found or discovered about this time. So there's a girl with a pearl earring version of that. And then here's a close-up of that one. And then I did a Gustav Klimt. On this one I was able to, to find an O. Henry short story. Um, about a kiss on it and use it as the uh, on the pixels for as far as the text. And then instead of having text on the wings, I chose just sort of a, a Art Nouveau motif that was associated with uh, Klimt's paintings. I was approached by um, a supermarket chain in Akron to, uh, they were building a new supermarket and they've always sort of included artworks in some of their, their recent builds. And so we went into that project with, it, it was a bull ride. It was with an architect, a designer, the ownership, um, a whole bunch of other people to try to come up with how, you know, things that we could incorporate into the construction of the supermarket. At first we were gonna do these designs um, that I had chosen traditional quilt patterns and then riffed on them with food items. And we were gonna do um, stained, stain the concrete on the foyer floor as we came in. Um, and there were lots and lots of sketches of those that we did and lots of uh, ways to do it. The brown little objects on here, you know, how the, how the foyer floor looks from above. And then we got to a point where it was like, oh, that's not gonna be durable enough. We can't really do that. So, well, let's look at the windows. So we looked at the windows and we were gonna do stained glass windows that were gonna look like quilts, which I thought was a really cool idea. Went and visited the glass manufacturers and um, turned out, did a bunch of sketches for that, turned out those down to even scaling them. And it turned out to be that the kiln wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna work out to the scale they wanted to do it. So that hit the cutting room floor. We looked at the main entrance and the foyer entrance wall, um, did a bunch of sketches for that. Nobody liked them. Or it was unclear who liked them and who didn't, as it you know with a big project. So it was frustrating, but at the same time, I was getting compensated fairly well, and I was getting it was giving me 
chance to go through and mock things up quickly and you know run them up the flagpole and get lots of different opinions. Um, ultimately, we decided upon just regular tiles on the foyer floor that I chose the patterns, I chose the colors, but it wasn't that satisfying based on everything else that had come before. But we did have some of those early sketches that were gonna be stained concrete and they decided that they wanted to put um, some of these early sketches, get them modified and sh shored up a bit and then put them on the uh, space between the windows. So these are the, the space between the windows in that supermarket. And then I made a fabric piece that went along with that. And then here's a close up of the, the quilt. This is full size queen uh, quilt, it's 89 by 108. And then the foyer, we came back to the foyer wall, um, boned up some sketches on that, decided there was gonna be a large sampler in the center and then off to the sides, we would do the, the standard quilt blocks. And these are, these are printed onto wood and then uh, put up and that, that center one is enormous. It's 14 foot by 14 foot and the side ones are your standard quilt barn block that are eight foot by eight foot. The Essence of Athens was a project I was part of and it, it sort of fit in well with the direction I was heading because the Ohio State University Knowlton School of Architecture has a professor there, Kyle Ezel. He approached our city planner and said, we wanna make Athens more unique. And look, we wanna look at city infrastructure that we can modify so that it's specific to Athens. Um, and so a bunch of us artists sat down and went through all of this and came up with some sketches. And these are some of the sketches I submitted. Um, we were looking at traffic boxes and the brick infrastructure and our crosswalks and how we could take uh, architectural motifs and include them in that and how we could make bike racks that you know sort of rift on our bricks. And so this is a, I ended up becoming a bigger part of that project went forward and made the plan so that the traffic boxes could get covered. And this is uh, one of the first realized one with local art is on our traffic boxes. This is a, a photograph that's been modified by Tim Creamer, a local artist. We ended up being able to do some crosswalks with that, that architectural motif that we have on the ridges, which is part of our university. Um, and a, it's an, a repurposed and an Sanus Island. Um, and the, the brick, Athens is famous for its brick industry. And we have a famous brick all about town. That's, you know, it says Athens block on all of them. And so we were able to make those and have it be, uh, the shadow would come through it. And then that led to, at the same time, I was making map of the bikeway between Athens and um, Nelsonville and went back and said, okay, how can I take essence of Athens and all that cultural stuff that came before and turn it into modern things? And so did that in such a way that um, took those architectural motifs from the windows and took an old beer label from 100 years ago and buildings and created a map that featured a lot of those things. There's a close up of that. And then here's the other side of the map. So again, it's not always just about the quilts it's sort of tying all this stuff together. Since I'm going back in the past and turning up things, I chose um, to make a traditional pattern and do a callback to the sugar packets with a traditional pattern. And in this piece, this piece showed at the Rife Gallery, I think in 2017, 2018, around then. Um, and it is sugar packets of my own design. And I'm also making the flies myself, but putting little quotes on the flies. And there's about a hundred flies on it. Um, and then it's two denominations. It's actually dollar bill and uh, Chinese yen. So these two not two currencies sort of you know, fighting for each other for the pattern. And then up close, it's a lot of uh, a lot of dialogue about the nature of money. So after that piece, it had gotten some some good uh, reviews and it's shown a few places, one of them being the National Quilt Museum in Paducah. And the curator there had asked me, said, well, hey, John, what would you make if you couldn't fail? And I, I was like, ah, that's a corny question. I've heard it before. But um, she asked it. She asked me it just before I was on my road trip back home. So I had a lot of time to think about it. And uh, it was like, I'm going to make a piece that changes color. And so how am I going to do that? And I was going through why well, I could do it, you know, a digital projector. I could do 
lights. I could also do fiber optics. And I ultimately decided on lights. There's a way that you can get something called individually addressable LED lights that will make pretty much any color you want them to be in any sequence that you want them to be. And so this is a construction piece of me, you know, sort of cutting the wires and getting them all spliced together and taping them down to the surface that I'm going to, you know, show them in. Um, and then there's a whole process to that where I'm thinking about, okay, how is this going to change from one color to another? And so I had all of the, the gifts that I had been doing where I've been doing that morphing from one thing to another, getting me thinking about timing and sequencing of, you know, how should that work? Where should it pause? Where should it move? Um, and so that led to this piece, which took a long time to go through all those details as far as the construction, figuring out how to use the lights, figuring out what power source, figuring out what those lights are going to shine through and how it's going to diffuse through the light, through lights are going to diffuse through that. Um, and so this piece is called of irritability and salinity. And um, it is set up so that it does change color. It uses two types of individually addressable lights. It uses strips and it also uses them on strands, the wire being the strands and then the strips are a little bit more permanent. And so here is sort of a time-lapse picture photo of it. And then I also have a video of it in here. And so there's this whole separate, well, whole, it's not separate. There's this whole world of open source uh, language that you can get these programmed with and you can get a little prototyping microprocessor and make it so that it'll do your own sequencing through it. And this one rotates through a couple different random uh, palettes from, and morphs from one to another. And this is a 41 by 75. So that led to me thinking about, oh, color. I'm looking at color completely different now. I need to bone up on that more so than I did when I was in school and thinking about color theory. I'm thinking about color now more in terms of, this is, my, this is the porch on my house where I painted it to sort of just something to break the, the chain of you know fighting with all the technology and thinking about color differently. Um, I'm thinking about color now more as as chords and music instead of that you know building block of art. I'm thinking about how it how it plays off of itself, how it can change from one to another. Um, this is my garage homage montage um, to Albers's uh, Joseph Albers is is uh, you know about color and its interaction. And so I'm, I'm thinking about it in all these different ways and, it, and then I'm ready to make the next piece and I'm, I want to do another callback to a tra tra traditional pattern. And so in this piece, I chose um, the ocean waves pattern, which you could see down there in the lower, lower portion of the, the screen, the lower right. And I wanted to take the light waves and, or the ocean waves and tilt it off into the horizon and then make it so that um, I could make the lights move in a, in a way sort of semi-abstract to the way ocean waves move and play on, that, play on that pun of light waves. And so this piece led to another way of looking at the lights because it uses a, instead of having them on a strand that where the lights chase on the strand, I'm using an, uh, an XY axis array where the, the color will move through the the surface of the quilt from one side to the other or back and forth off into the distance instead of chasing. And, and I'm using a, a random noise, a noise pattern. And noise patterns are really interesting. They're, um, they're algorithms that you can decide how big a splotch you, of color you want to go through there and how small. At the same time, I can decide how random I want those colors to be going through there. Um, and I can decide if I want random colors. So there's all these, all these, this gold mine of things I can choose from as far as uh, things to build upon. And, and if you want to know more about it, uh, you can go to my website. There's a descriptor page there on the light waves piece. Um, made a piece where I did the riff on the, uh, the waves. I put them in a curve more um, after the Japanese prints by Hokusai. Uh, here's a close up of that. These get to be interesting where it's, it's really hard. You, you get a nice crisp picture when you take a photograph of it, but when you do the video, it comes out a little bit different. 
you have to really tweak the lighting. So here's a general feel for that. Rolling through there. And of course, the horizon's changing colors, uh, top and bottom on this one as, it, as the colors move through it. This piece um, is called Facet Nation. It's 52 by 52. Um, here I'm, again, making a quilt pattern of my own or a quilt-esque pattern. It's not a traditional quilt pattern, but it looks like it could be. Um, sort of getting, trying to see what happens when you make that pattern circular and you have the, the motion of the noise going through and see if I can get the, the color to sort of expand and contract. Um, and this piece was, I took it a step further on this piece because I have all of this electronic stuff at my disposal now. I um, added a range detector to the center of it and it will change, it's interactive. It will change according to how close or far away you are from the piece. Um, as you get closer, it will sort of calm down. And as you move back further away, it will uh, jump, jump to life. And if you get really close to it, um, it actually goes into a more uh, monotone color. It just goes to a solid color. After that piece, uh, I was approached by a collector who wanted a large scale electronic piece. He actually came to the studio. I showed him all my work. He said, oh, that's great. And he, I had some of the electronic pieces up and all they wanted to talk about were my older pieces. And then um, as, they were, as they were getting ready to leave, I said, what do you think about the new work? And they said, what new work? And then I said, well, what about all the color changing pieces? And he said, well, I thought, oh, those are quilts. We thought those were computer screens. <laughs> which you know, blew their mind when I went up and pulled back the fabric and showed them that it was actually a quilt. And then at that point, he's like, yeah, I want something that's electronic. So this is the start of that piece. Um, I decided to do, he, the, the criteria was to do a piece called the time, based on Bob Dylan's song, the times they are changing, not necessarily exactly, but something that sort of had a starting point for that. So I chose our map of the United States I made all these shard shaped pieces and put in my own um, sort of mock towns, put in some rivers as well, did a little bit of play with that. And so this piece changes colors and I have uh, some details of that. And then we also have, uh, this piece will actually change color from, depending on where the viewer is, if the viewer is off to the right, it will be, uh, mostly red, and then the viewer moves off to the left, it'll turn mostly blue. If you have two viewers standing equally equal distance away from it um, in cooperation with each other, they will get that multicolor. Um, and here we can see how it sort of gets real hyper there and it goes all to red. And then when you go over to the other side, it'll get real hyper and go to blue. Um, it was approached by a group of artists who wanted to make a show that commemorated the 100-year uh, anniversary of women's suffrage, or women's right to vote. I chose the starting point being a quilt that's in the collection of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and then decided I was going to incorporate some quilting in it based on some uh, political commentary from the time. So here's a construction piece of that. Here's me sewing the piece together. Here's the light box. Here's uh, sort of what it looks like when you start soldering things together, turning the lights on. Of course, at some point you put it up on the wall, you get your computer out, you make it decide how it's going to change colors. And so this piece changes colors accordingly. Uh, here's a quick video of that, where it has sort of this uh, flaming going through the flag. And when you get close to it, actually, those colors become more um, more rainbow flag colors. When you're further away, it's it's sort of flaming red or flaming blue. When you interact with it, it has a nice feature. Um, doing a piece that's based on Johannes Itten's uh, color wheel. He's a contemporary of Joseph Albers. This piece came together pretty quickly. Um, I made this piece for Scribble and Play. It's on display now at the Dairy Barn. Here's a construction piece of that. This is, uh, again, working with lights and trying to take pictures of LED lights is tricky. It, it, it's a whole new ball game as far as trying to capture that image. You can see how my camera catches something different than my cell phone catches and our eyes are so much better. I mean, we think camera technology is wonderful and great. 
and it is, but our eyes capture that light so much better. Um, here's a close-up of the fabric going over that. And I'm, I'm stitching with uh, clear thread on this. So you get the, the stitching going through. Here's another close-up of the colors changing. This piece also has a uh, range detector in it. Here are some pictures of it as it changes color. Here's an overall. And this piece I'm using not so much, I'm still using noise, but I'm using the noise in a different way. I'm using them on, and the array for this piece is in rings. So each ring has sort of its own, a mind of its own and can change accordingly. Um, and here is a quick uh, interaction with it where uh, I'm actually coming into the picture now, we're getting closer to it. And as you get closer or further away, the lights will uh, turn off and turn on. And if you get really, really close, they all go out. And then as you step back, they turn on. You step forward, they turn off. And so it's, this is a part of, a, again, it's part of Scribble and Play. It's at the Dairy Barn, I think, until April 17th. It's part of a, uh, an art show for kids. So that was the idea, was to make it about color and interaction. Here is uh, constructions of another piece I'm working on. It's, uh, I'm trying to take a traditional quilt pattern and use it more in a Rothko style where it's uh, changing colors and less about um, trying to be anything specific, but more of just be try to, try to capture more of you know, the emotional feel of the color and how it moves through. Here's a raw picture before the quilt goes up on top of it. Here's a studio picture. And here's a video. Hey, John, uh, yeah. I just want to pop in and let you know there that we're at 1252. So you keep on talking. And if folks have questions, please pop those in the chat. Um, we do have one question in here. And it's uh, from Amy would like to know uh, what project or idea is keeping you awake at night? Or what is the next media you plan on tackling? So Right now, I have this idea about going kinetic. And I'm working with electric electricity, and it's relatively low voltage, not a lot of power. Um, and so computer, the little fan that's inside your computer runs on five volts. And so I'm thinking about instead of, well, maybe incorporating it with lights or without lights, it's still in its infancy and I may never go there. You know, that's, that's how these things work. But I'm thinking about if I had a whole array of those fans that blew and didn't blow and they turn on and off. And if they turn on and off on fabric, how would that fabric move? So that, that's one idea. Another idea, I don't know if I have the guts to do this or not, but um, it's, I want to make it, you know, you see these waterfall kind of paintings where water goes from a, a, a trough to a top. And I was thinking about, well, what if you took a quilt and did that? And then I was like, what if it went a little, a little step further than water? What if it was honey? And what would that be like? And so, and how would that, how would that interact in a gallery setting? It would make, probably make gallery people crazy, you know, as far as somebody would want to touch it. And then of course we could call out all the people who touch things because they would have sticky fingers. But it was just one of those like, it was one of those like, you know, one of those ideas like you really push. If you couldn't fail, how, what would you do? How far would you go? You know, so th those are like two ideas. Um, there are a couple others that I'm, you know, still working that I'm sort of fighting with. So, so, and, and you did interrupt me at uh, precisely the right time. That was my second to last slide. Um, You can find me on, uh, of course, I should talk about the word juxtapassion. That's a word that I've uh, made up. And so it's just the idea that uh, I like putting things side by side that can spark sort of that inspiration or that, that emotion. Um, and so juxtapassion, I just made it up. Uh, it is my uh, website, juxtapassion.com. And it's my Instagram handle. And of course I have Facebook and Wikipedia pages as well. Wonderful. All right, so um, as we kind of wrap up here, let's chat a little bit about if you um, 
feel comfortable stopping the screen share, then you and I can just chat. And I will go ahead and pin both of us. So something that I, I really appreciate about your work is that you deal with really um, serious content, but also approach it with a sense of humor as an entry point. Um, and what I see in that is also repetition. So I see repetition, you know, repeating um, patterns as well as uh, going back and having that symbiotic nature of your work and, and what you call the callback. Um, can you share a little bit about um, how you encourage other artists to dip into that as a way to break through? Um, well, it has to start someplace. And it doesn't have to, you don't have to hit it out of the park the first time. You know, it, I think that that is where some people get hung up. New artists are like, oh, I can never make something like that. So, well, you can't, you have to make something like you would make it. So you have to start someplace. And even if it's, even if it's not good, don't get frustrated. It's, it's, and I have things that I look at and I go, I, I don't ever want to show that to anybody, but then I, can go back and go, well, that was part of the process. You know, again, it's it's that old cliche, don't be afraid to fail, but it really is true. It's like if if you I think that's 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 a good brief sort of just, you know, start someplace and then build on it. And don't be afraid to fail. And and those failures are not failures. They're actually building blocks for what may come next. Wonderful. So uh You've been a part of Quilt National before, and um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of that exhibition um, in your work and maybe in your community as well? Um, I mean, it, it opened up a bigger audience for the work. Um, it Quilt National made me step it up you know I, I you i made that one good piece and then it was like it was terrifying because it's like well what if that was the only good piece i could ever make and then the next the second piece it was there was a lot of pressure to make that second piece really good so it definitely made me step it up um it, it is it is nice to have it here in the community i mean it's, it's nice that it's convenient and close by i can go over there and see it whenever i want um the, 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 I, I guess I'm looking for the word that's in between brotherhood and sisterhood um, or uniform, but the, you know, the, 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 the support I get from other artists in the quilt community is, is fairly strong. And not to say that, you know, there aren't situations where we, we kind of go at each other over philosophical differences, but in general, um, it's a very accepting group. So, yeah, the, you know, the, I talked about Hillary Fletcher before and, you know, she really laid a really good blueprint for that show to go from just a, you know, a local to an international level show. Wonderful. So um, you intersect a lot of your interests. And I, I also find that really interesting. Um, in how you've pulled in the materials of cycling and also not just quilt community, but Athens as a community. Like there's a real, there's a real service to that in the use, not only of the materials, but of uh, uplifting community culture. Can you chat a little bit about how you believe Athens has impacted your work? Well, I mean, you know, authors are told, write what you know. And so, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's clear in the work how it's, it's, a, a, you know, affecting me. I just, I, I go and look at the, the, the cultural history and I have this debate, you know, at times where it's like, well, is it Athens or is it 
that could be anywhere. You know, if I if I were still living in, in between Akron and Cleveland, I think I would still be drawing off some of the historical stuff up there and, and still be creative that way. And it's just, I mean, Athens is, in my I mean, in my opinion, it is a it is a it's a vibrant place to live. I mean, it has its its detractions that were far away from a lot of other, you know, big cultural influences. But at the same time, it's you know, it's worked well for me. Well, I think that that is a, a really excellent place for us to, to close it out. Um, I wanna thank you again, John, for sharing your work and your story. I, I think it'll be really inspiring for not only the folks that are on um, watching now, but those in the future. Uh, so much appreciation for you popping on and doing this artist talk. Uh, thanks to the folks that joined us um, and Thank you to the Dairy Barn for putting on such great exhibitions. This is a part of the 2022, excuse me, 2021 uh, Quilt National that was produced and circulated by the Dairy Barn Art Center in Athens, Ohio. Um, I also want to make sure that we thank the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, and the governor who support the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks and have a great day.